is another podcast, and I'm really excited. I, I say that, I probably should have a different way to intro these podcasts, but th I'm genuinely excited when I say that. And this particular guest, whenever I talk with him, uh, it's just a blast. And I, I always feel uh, feel very comfortable with this with this gentleman. We all, you know, I can just uh, rant and rant, and then he rants back at me. It's a wonderful uh, friendship that I have with this man. This is Pete Mena. Pete, so glad you're here. We're going to have a fantastic podcast. Are you ready to get into it? Oh, yeah. I am absolutely ready, bud. This isn't another fishing podcast. This is another fishing podcast. I haven't talked to you in a while, and I know I'm I'm really kind of a terrible friend in in, in a lot of respects because I I keep very all my really good friends. There's very little communication with them. I'm I'm essentially like um, I'm um what do you call it? I'm a recluse a lot of times, but. Um, I think Pete knows this, how much I, I uh, uh, am, a, am a big fan, uh, not only for his angling prowess, but also just he's a great friend, and I, uh, I admire him, and I always love to hear his, um, his thoughts on things, especially current events and, of course, fishing. But, and nowadays, there's so much to talk about with current events. The last time uh, we had a conversation on here, YouTube actually pulled down a little little uh, clip from a podcast because it was too offensive for YouTube. So we have to watch out uh, with what we say, which is just remarkable to me. I still can't believe the world that we're living in, quite frankly, with the censorship and the nonsense. And so, uh, Pete, I think you're um, probably with me here. A great alternative uh, to YouTube has been Rumble. So that might be something that I start thinking about here uh, as well as YouTube. But anyway, I'm rambling, dude. What the hell is going on in your life? Well, uh, I just got back from a Canadian trip, unfortunately, to be uh, greeted by lots of downed trees from a storm near tornado or tornado nearby. So I have been chainsawing. I didn't get a chance to actually take a shower. I may have sawdust in my hair still. I still have one huge popple tree hanging over a storage shed that I'm not exactly sure what I'm going to do with that yet, but uh, I'm a little worn out after 14 hour days of fishing in Canada that I wasn't used to. And then I got home and grabbed a chainsaw and I've been cutting up trees we're, either we're, at the house or at the cabin. So how did I, there was a storm, you know, I guess we're not we're not I mean, too terribly far away from each other, but it might have been the same storm, I guess. There's a lot of storms. Um, you know, leaving Minnesota that were really strong a few days ago and then and going into maintaining their strength and going into Wisconsin. So it's probably what was going on there. We yeah. had we had a we had a thunderstorm here that not to get like super weather nerdy, but we had a storm that was like bowing out, you know. Whenever you see that on a radar, a storm bowing out and moving like this. I'm gonna try it with a camera. It's doing, you know, doing this. Uh, really bowed out like that a real that means you're you're in for some super heavy winds batting down the hatches and there was a storm like that um that said that kind of it was starting to really make me nervous it was getting close to us but then it kind of fell apart but there was a lot of stuff in that system that eventually moved i guess to over to your neck of the woods and wreaked havoc so um you know yeah pretty nasty and and a bit scary i told my wife when i got home i said i wish you really wouldn't have done that because there i am literally in the middle of lake of the woods and all of a sudden my phone starts blowing up kading 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 all these little messages and finally i'm like who is doing that i said to christian leitner i'm like i gotta check this and here the first thing i see that my wife had sent me is this tornado warning which we never get here and uh, so then I had to sit around and wonder if I had a wife and a house and dogs left for a little while. But it uh, turned out to be just, you know, a lot of rain and the tornado didn't hit quite a bit of wind, obviously. But uh, we all survived. Yeah, well, is... that's good. That's very good to hear. Yeah, no, that's that's nothing to mess around with. I kind of I always knew that, you know, obviously tornadoes are a, a very scary thing, but it was <sighs> I mean, it's a long time ago now. It's crazy how time flies. But I went through Joplin, Missouri, 
two hours before one of the worst tornadoes to hit the United States. It happened in, I want to say it was like 2011 this happened. And so I was going from Springfield, Missouri to Tulsa, Oklahoma. I was driving on 40 there, Interstate 40. And uh, I believe that's the Interstate 40s, right? And two hours, you know, before that big uh, tornado hit Joplin, I drove, you know, right by that town. And on the radio and everything, they're talking about they're forecasting really severe weather, you know. And I got to I got to my destination in Tulsa. I look back, uh, you know, and that, that's basically, you know, Tulsa is about an hour and a half, I want to say, from Joplin, something like that. Finally got to Tulsa. I look back, and at that time, there was the most the uh, it was such a high thunderstorm it was so big and that the top of that thunderstorm was so high i'd never seen anything like it before and that was that storm that that tornado that ef5 that just devastated that town and i kind of and then i had to fly back out of springfield so i had to go back through uh joplin and i saw the damage some of the damage and i was behind a um a uh, a mobile morgue unit driving to the airport and it just i don't know it made a and it made an impact on me and i'm always just kind of like okay you know like whenever there's a tornado warning or just severe weather i, I kind of go into almost like a a ptsd situation sort of because i just it's just that town it was like an atomic bomb dropped on it you know and it's just crazy to think that that wind you know essentially just the atmosphere can do that you know but oh. Yeah, yeah it's it's, not, that's where it's said. Fortunately, we got a, you know, we got a basement. So, you know, and I knew everybody was down there. So I figured they'd still be there one way or the other. But uh, yeah, yeah, it's pretty scary. Well, the thing too is like fishermen, I think we probably, you know, I want to say people in the outdoors, fishermen, hunters, they probably have a better understanding or appreciation for weather as well, you know, because I mean, it's so... I mean, we're out there, especially on the water. You could see when stuff's building. You kind of have an idea of how, after a while, how stuff, you know, forms and, and how long it takes. And I think we just have a better appreciation for that. But anyway, so how was that, that trip, man? You were with Leitner up there, and that's an annual trip, right? Oh, I fished with him quite a bit, except for, you know, when I couldn't get up there for, uh, obviously, several years because of the COVID stuff. But, uh, yeah. Yeah, I normally fish with him two, three times a year up there. He loves Lake of the Woods. And I would say overall the uh, the fishing was so-so, maybe a little below average. But he did get one big one. Uh, we, caught, we caught four in three days, missed several, quite a few follows. Unfortunately, everything was happening right by the boat. They literally would not hit out away from the boat. We had one hit, just one. And uh, unfortunately, it was timed at the point that uh, Leitner took a cast, started retrieving, and decided to walk to the back of the boat to grab something. I forget what. And when his big foot hit the lower level, that's when the fish hit. That was the only strike. And uh, he was a little out of position. <laughs> oh, goodness. Didn't get it, but uh, so what happens? What do you, do you yell at him? I mean, do you what you know? You have that strong of a friendship that you can just give him shit? Or? Oh, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's like fifteen years now. Yeah, nice. I, nice. I, I called him a big so and so. Let's just say, and I said you can't wait for another ten seconds to finish your retrieve to walk to the back of the boat. You know when muskies bite, they suck. That's, yeah, that's, I mean, you're, you're, you're fishing with Pete Maney. You got to know that muskies suck. You got to be ready for this. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> so if people don't know, who uh, explain who Christian Leitner is. Because well, that's probably uh, pretty important. He had a, uh, oh, I don't know, like 14-year pro career dream team uh, in the Olympics and uh, probably still best known for uh, his career at Duke. Arguably, you know, he's maybe the the best known college player and, and made the shot and, you know, won a championship that is still talked about to this day. And uh, but, yeah, tremendous, tremendous player and uh, interesting guy when he uh, in his pro career, he got uh, sent to uh, 
uh, the Timberwolves are signed. I shouldn't say sent. He wasn't slapped and said, hey, you got to do this. But he went there in the... Uh, get over on that team and play for them, yeah, please. Get over for on millions that. of dollars. We're going to give you millions of dollars. <laughs> and the, uh, the, the strength and conditioning coach there, Saul Brandes, at the time... Uh, I forget how long his career was. I have met him and fished with him as well. Nice guy. But he was hooked on Lake of the Woods and Muskies, and he invited Leitner up there. And he never even caught one on the first trip, but he saw a few, and that was enough. And, uh, you know, he just one of those addictive personalities. I think, in a way, musky fishing kind of matches with that. Anybody that, you know, you, you you got to have, you know, the the ability physically to be a pro, but I think you got to be, a you know, an extremely driven person to excel uh, as well. And and I think that kind of plays into the musky thing, the challenge of it and everything. So, yeah, he's he's basically an addict. He'll fish other stuff, but he's pretty much musky only. Yeah, you know, with with musky fishing, I, I make um, I, I, I we've talked about this, I'm sure, but I think it's like the most ridiculous thing to call fishermen athletes. Okay, like <laughs> it's it's really one of those pet peeves of mine. Like you know, and especially these. Uh, and listen, I'm a I'm a I'm a multi species angler, right? Um, and I you know I'm thin, but I would not call myself. My wife calls me skinny fat. Because I might appear to be skinny, but my body fat is actually just through the roof, you know? <laughs> um, I just had a real nice carton of uh, Ben and Jerry's last night. Um, you know, and that's, I mean, that's become a more regular thing. So it's just, it's not, I mean, I'm, this is probably genetics, you know, more than anything for me. Um, but, but, but there's a lot of bat. My point is there's a lot of bass anglers in particular, because I work with bass anglers more than any a- anglers. Uh, any type of angler, and uh, there's uh, there's a quite a few of these anglers who I love. Listen, I work with them all the time. It's it's my bread and butter gig. You know, I can't be um, you know being uh, talking ill of anybody here, and I and I'm not. But uh, there's a lot of of anglers that consider themselves athletes that I think they need to you know maybe. I, I don't want to be controversial here, but look in the mirror, really try to be objective about your fitness level. And I would not be putting that you're an athlete in your profile. I'm not trying to be rude. I'm just trying to be realistic here. But like, but with that being said, I will say uh, musky fishermen may be athletes. I mean, you partic- I'm not gonna, I don't want you to feel awkward, Pete, but you're, you're probably the best shape angler I've ever worked with. Well, I, I don't know. I, I stay in shape. I can tell you it's a lot of work. Uh, I, I did notice because I hadn't musky fish much. I've been mainly doing the other stuff this spring and into summer. We had a hot spell and blah, blah, blah. My dad can't musky fish anymore. So for a lot of reasons, I wasn't really in shape for it. And when you when you go and go like you do in Canada, there's nothing else to do. And it's, it's light till 10 o'clock. So you know, you wake up at six and away you go and you take one little break for dinner and uh, you go all day. And it, it is a lot of work. I mean, that uh, that second day was hard to get through. And it was kind of funny because I I came through it in the third day. I, I, I did a lot better. You know, I just felt better. And I think I was starting to, you know, get, get into it and get fit for it. But it's, you know, you're using different muscles and you're walking around the one. One thing you really notice is if, and it's rare for me because I mainly cast, but once in a while I'll be, you know, trolling. I'll be trolling and casting. And boy, when you switch from trolling to casting, it's amazing. You for sure drop one layer and sometimes two when you make that switch. So there's a, you know, there's a little bit more, obviously, just throwing a lure and retrieving, but, uh, there's there's quite a bit to it i think it is kind of physical and and frankly in the case of musky fishing i think to a certain extent there's uh you know some of it's mental because they're they're such a low density critter that you're always thinking they're hard to pattern you know you go hours and hours without seeing them at all and if you you know some people care a little less maybe they're not quite as mad at them as i am but i'm you know i'm trying to find them trying to figure them out trying to pattern them and and 
when it's going good, you're not doing as much of that. All of us, you know, you you got a pattern, say it's weeds, rocks, whatever it might be, and then then it's just okay. You you've got it, and you know where to run. And but when everything's flat, and you've got a million acres, and you're racking your brain as to you know what to do next, I think that adds a little bit of mental stress as well to the whole thing. So uh, it's. I guess it's physical. I definitely wouldn't call it athletic compared to soccer or basketball or something like that, but uh, it's a workout. Yeah, like to me, like in fishing, you know, it's funny that this is, I've made this like a real issue for me, like that, that I have to talk about this on a somewhat consistent basis. Um, I, I mean, there's a lot bigger things going on in the world, but let's, let's talk about this for a second. Um, like, I mean, it, it's... I, I just don't – I want to know what goes on in someone's head that, to me, to be an, uh, 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 an athlete, you have to be doing something athletic, right? And so an athlete, that would mean, you know, it's – it's I don't know. Any, I'm not going to get it. It's just a funny thing. I, I just want to know what goes on in someone's head, especially some of these fig, these 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 uh, body shapes I'm seeing, and they're considering themselves athletes. It's just bizarre to me. But – Whatever. I'm going to move on. I think that's probably for the best before I get yeah. in trouble and I get uh, I get called out, you know, while I'm working one day. Uh, but I, more than anything, I wanted to. Well, here's what. For, first of all, so Tex isn't fishing for muskies anymore. You just kind of this is this. I This is the first I've heard this. Your, your dad's not fishing for muskies anymore. Oh, he'll he'll try it a little bit. We got a Canada trip booked, and I'm sure he'll try it a little bit. But he's 83, and he's got a bad shoulder, and he just can't can't do it long, you know. Okay, uh, okay. Anyway. Well, it's just so people know. So Tex is, Tex is Pete's dad, and and I've worked with Tex a, a few times, and uh, may, more than a few times, I guess, through the years. And he's he's uh, one of the most likable people. Um, and, and your relationship with your father is, is, and just your parents, I think I see it on social media too, Pete, like, uh, which I love, you know, the, the photos you have with your outings, just, you know, your family outings going to a local lake and, and you're, uh, you're out with Esther, you know, your, your pups and your, your, your parents. And I'm just like this, you've, you've got it figured out. And the fact is like your, your mom and dad are badasses. They're like... <laughs> They've ran, they've ran a resort. They've ran a logging operation. And your mom is like, I can tell. I don't know your mom that well. I know Tex a lot better. But they're just like, no nonsense, no excuses. Get your shit done, you know. And I think of myself like, this country would be in such better shape if we had more people like your parents and you, quite frankly. <laughs> well, I appreciate that. I definitely agree on my parents. And uh, yeah, yeah, I, I, I told my son actually a few years back, he's 22 now, but uh, I remember when, when he was 11 and I said, well, you got to you gotta start uh, doing a little more work, son, projects, this, that, and the other, and he's kind of whining about it. And I said, you know, I said, Son, this is the absolute truth. I said, my dad was running a logging operation, or I should say your grandpa, and uh, at the time, and he stuck a chainsaw in my hand and said, cut down trees when I was 11. I says, you, you've never touched a chainsaw. <laughs> and, and, and I said, my dad, when I asked him for a 10-speed bicycle, I already had a bicycle, but I wanted a 10-speed. And I told Tex, I said, Everybody else is getting 10 speeds. Their parents are buying them 10 speeds and this, that, and the other. And, and Dad says, you can have a 10 speed. You can have two. You can have three. He said, get another job and buy as many 10 speeds as you want. I mean, that's, that's how it works. Makes sense. <laughs> it's, it's the, way, it's it the way of the world. <laughs> and you're, and you're, not, you're not doing any, uh, any young people any favors telling them otherwise, you know? Like, no. it's like, I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm amazed that it's just, I, I don't know. I'm not a parent, but, uh, you are really doing uh, your children a disservice raising them. If you're not preparing them to be resilient, you know, and, no. and, and to, uh, 
you know, to be able to work for things and, 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 it, and it's, it's rewarding, you know, it's rewarding to work for things and then to accomplish things. And, and, and it's not a bad thing. Like if you instill that early on, you know, it's not a chore. Like it's not a, it's not something that it's something, okay, well, if I work for something, I get rewarded, you know, right. to me, I don't know, but it's, are things exaggerated nowadays or, you know, are things not as bad as it seems? I don't know. I mean, I guess social media can have a, can, ha, can, can kind of have maybe an amplifying, uh, you know, kind of aspect to it to make things maybe like there's the problems are, you know, it, it looks like the problems are worse than they are maybe with the, you know, the young generation. I don't know, but it, it's, <laughs> I mean, you you and I were both like news junkies, so it can't. Anytime we talk, it's always been this way. Whenever we work together, yeah, we talk fishing, no doubt. But I can't help but get into this stuff with you. So I'm sorry if I'm sliding into that. Um, but you, but it's just like I don't know, man. That's why I, I I've always enjoyed talking with you, and I know one of the things that I love, you know, one of the things I really love about you is that you are not afraid to speak your mind. So when we talk, it's just it's just kind of it inevitably turns into these kind of uh, rant sessions, which I love. But I don't want you to do anything that gets you in any trouble with my, you know, my podcast <laughs> here. So don't whatever. Don't go down any roads you don't want to go down, I guess is what I'm saying. But let me let me turn it back into fishing here. Um, uh, so uh, with with Leitner, so you guys, what was the so how did the trip go? You you guys, what what was the how many follows? How many fish in the boat? Like what what happened? Oh well, I don't remember all of the details on follows. We only we only actually boated for and and we lost a few and blah blah blah. Not a tremendous amount of follows. Not as many as normal. Uh, the, the the pattern we found was actually. Uh, not all that much of a pattern other than there were windows. And, and uh, interestingly, I always follow all this stuff, you know, it's the, uh, the first day I thought the moon stuff was going to matter because we had a really tight, intense window during a minor period in the morning. Uh, Could have caught three, caught two, and uh, saw one more and then it was over. And I thought, oh, okay. Well, the rest of the trip, Majors and minors, if anything, that was a time to avoid. Uh, there were windows, uh, but they were they were outside of the moon period. So that's why I always talk about that, that that matters, but it doesn't matter. And you certainly shouldn't or it doesn't matter at times. And you can't, you know, you can't live by it. It shouldn't, it shouldn't be the only time you go. Some people get so wrapped up on that kind of stuff. Now, if there's a tremendous amount of weather changes in a day, it usually makes the moon period moot because they're going to react to barometric pressure changes over moon any day, in my opinion, from what I've seen all the years I've done this. But, uh, but usually, and we had steady weather for the most part, uh, usually when it's steady weather, that's when the moon matters and it didn't. And so you got to be prepared for that. And, you know, it was, it, it was very simply for us. You start getting serious about 1230 the last two days and you had about an hour and a half window there. And then, unfortunately, I, I think there was a pretty good window, right? You know, the, the, the only time we were in was at six o'clock because that was camp dinner. And uh, unfortunately, I think we were we were missing windows there because we would get out after dinner and immediately start seeing fish and have shots. And then the actual evening kind of sucked overall. No kidding. So so you you missed you missed it, basically. Uh, We we very well may have missed it. And, you know, we talked about it, you know but we felt like it'd be kind of rude. They were planning on us and blah, blah, blah. Neither one of us are that mad at them these days. Uh, We weren't technically filming a show. We're running GoPros and we're going to put something together for the YouTube channel. But, and we did get some good stuff, but we, we, uh, yeah, we were screwing up. I mean, if I was, if I was filming a TV show with limited time, I would have after the first day, 
I would have said, nope, there's no dinner. We got to bring something with us and, and we got to keep going. And if anything, you know, we could even come in early if we were tired by the time we got that pattern because you could hardly see a fish at the end. So, uh, but yeah, it was interesting. And I want to add this before I forget, we had a blast because we basically, you know, because we weren't doing a show, I would say that the spots we fished, 85% of them, we found them and had never fished them before. We just did a lot of exploring. We picked a new section of Lake of the Woods that neither one of us had fished. We were fortunate there wasn't a whole lot of wind. So we could get out to some big water areas that, you know, in a, let's say a 15 mile an hour wind, you wouldn't even go near it kind of stuff. Right, it, it, right, right. Far to travel in big waves. You know, you can do it, but it just wastes so much time getting there. So you and, felt uh, there was less pressure, you know, the pressure, like, the, you know, to go with, okay, well, this is, you know, when you're, you got the pressure of a TV show uh, on you, you feel like, well, we better go to the places that have produced in the past, you know, yeah. and you can't experiment as much when you have that kind of pressure on, uh, placed upon you. So it was nice to just, you know, do something for, you have the GoPros going, doing something for your YouTube channel that allowed you to explore more. And that, that's really cool. And plus, the reality is that's a great story for, for uh, a YouTube video, for any video, even for a oh, TV yeah. show, if you, you know, if you can invest that amount of time. Yeah, in reality, it really was. And, you know, we, we both like to do that. And, uh, you know, we were... We were checking spots for weeds, read the quality of the rocks, you know, the way everything lays out, you know, you look at some spots on a map and they look tremendous and you go there and there's, you know, there's not, there's not the scattered big boulders. There's not the little holes, saddles, different things that hold fish. Sometimes you show up and it's, it's more of a gravel deal, fairly flat. Obviously once in a while you get lucky and you get the combination of weeds and rocks, which is always tremendous. And, but, you know, you are technically wasting time in, in, in a lot of aspects. I mean, you pull into bays and pull into spots that you're thinking weeds are going to be, the weeds aren't there, but then all of a sudden, you know, you pull into one and all of a sudden everything looks good. And it was, it was really kind of neat because, uh, we had fished a rock spot for the first time and it was getting to that, that kind of magic time, but it was a super hot day. And he had raised a big fish, pretty hot, on a rock point, and uh, we were both dying. He says, I got to go in the water. So I went around the corner to a little sand beach. He jumped in the water, got cooled off. We go check the next spot we thought would be good. We look at it, and it's like, oh, this does look good. And we weren't even going to fish it. And, and, uh, and, well, we better fish it. Well, then, you know, five minutes later, he was catching a 49.50 incher on a spot wow. we didn't wow. even look nice. at before. That's so awesome. yeah, it's really cool. You know. Is it that for me, you know, I, I find myself like I've one of the things that I enjoy most about fishing is the exploratory part of it. Like it's a huge part of it actually for me. You know, I I mean I like learning something new um uh, you know not just locationally but like you might find something that the fish are doing that you didn't realize they would be doing in that depth of water or that amount of current or that uh, uh, less amount of current, you know? Um, yeah. Uh, so I, I always am like, well, yeah, anglers think that they're not over there or traditionally they've not gone over there. But I'm like, I have the tendency to want to be like, but I want to go over there. Maybe they're over there now. You know, maybe right. something changed with the fishery that people just historically haven't been going over there, but something changed and now they're over there and you could load the boat. I, I always have that kind of like thought in my head when I fish, you know, I, I, yeah, you got your areas that have produced in the past, but one of the most enjoyable things for me with fishing is to explore and to say, well, maybe there's something going on there. Or maybe the fish are doing something. Uh, that I don't think they'd be doing, but they're doing. Let's just test it. You know, I, t and the great thing about fishing is that you're never going to know everything. So I, I think, I think exploring is just one of the great aspects of, of, uh, you know, the sport. Oh, well, I, yeah, I, I agree totally. I mean, to me, that's half the sport, if not more. I, there's too much emphasis on 
catching really even though we all want to catch and and unfortunately part of that is is social media i mean everybody wants to have the the grab and grin holding photo seems like that what you get the most likes on unfortunately even more likes on a release or something like that that i think is actually cooler but the whole the whole concept of yeah, exploring like that and just and just trying new stuff completely on your own and it's a it's an unfortunate change maybe i'm getting into the rant stage here a little bit that you and i I, both I encourage it but i mean uh i there's way too many anglers in my opinion that are that are missing it now i mean they're they they would rather have someone tell them you know, whether it's waypoints or a mark map or whatever, or spying on people, which I see a lot of, unfortunately, uh, you know, the Miami boat kind of stands out and you can tell when it's happening you see what they do. And I don't know, it's, you know, I, I, I'll take spots, you know, if somebody tells me, uh, but I, I have a lot more fun and a lot more enjoyment and feel a hell of a lot better about, finding the spot like i just described and you know you catch one that way i mean to me that fish is three times cooler than anything if if somebody gave you a mark map and say here's where i was catching all my fish they're good spots and you go there i get that too to a certain extent but to me that's not what it's all about i i would far rather be on a lake i've never been on before or explore a new section like we just discussed and and find stuff for yourself and 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 get a fish there you know and and just kind of learn and put it together we had uh we had several spots one was one was real interesting i you know i i told leitner he agreed i i'm like this is a classic i said they're gonna be here and he agreed and we fished it and nothing but we came back on the uh, on the last day and didn't get it but we had a great big one come in there and you know sure enough and of course then we both said well you know we knew this had to be good and you know obviously one was sitting there it's just a matter of timing at that point but uh it's it's so fun to do that and to me a lot more rewarding when you do get one yeah no i couldn't i couldn't agree more um yeah that's i it's i I agree it's like half i would say it's half of fishing if maybe not a little bit more than that, then, you know, as far as just, it's just, that's, it's just fun. You know, the thing too, and we can get into this too. What were you, um, were you catching most of your fish, uh, uh, surface on surface baits or what, how are you catching them? Oh, no, that was kind of a, kind of a bummer. We had very little top water action. One nip, actually, <laughs> it's kind of funny. The, the fish, the only fish that hit on the retrieve when Leitner was walking, actually came in and took a weird nip at my top water but that was literally the only fish we had on top water we had uh i would say a combination of paddle tail soft plastics and uh spinner bait leitner loves spinner baits and he was throwing them in front of the boat and that's uh i guess what he caught his three fish on i only caught one yeah he caught them all he caught them all on the figure eight Got it. Oh, that's interesting. Why would they? Why would they be inch? I mean, we've done shoots with Thorpe, uh, Mark Thorpe, which are some of the most fun memories I've had in my career. Uh, going up to the um, the Ottawa River, correct? Was the Ottawa yeah. River? Um, yeah, and, and near Montreal. Uh, Saint Lawrence, a little bit. Too. Uh, uh, yeah, right, right, right. Saint Lawrence, right. Um, and and. I was always amazed whenever we'd go up there, we'd be trolling, um, you know, in the prop wash. So the prop wash, you know, we'd have uh, some of our bait. I don't know. How, how many were we typically trolling? Two, maybe in there, like in the yeah, prop wash. Well, like, yeah, two or three is all, you know, it's only one one line per man there. So Yeah, yeah. so it was it was like the, the lures right in the prop wash of the outboard. Like, I mean, six feet of line out. <laughs> so the, the rod tips like mashed into the water, six feet of line out right into the, the prop wash of the outboard. And, yeah. and, and so those muskies, to, correct me if I'm wrong, Pete, but my understanding is those muskies are actually curious about the boat. 
And so they'll they'll follow the boat, I guess, and then they see that lure and then they hit the lure. That's that's yeah. what's going on there, I presume. Oh yeah, in a lot of cases, and and I I hear that short line trolling has slowed down there a little bit. I you know, fish of all types, I think learn a lot more than you know we give them credit for you can see lakes that are pressured and this that and the other and that one thing this in this particular case it really makes sense that short line trolling is not quite as effective as it used to be just because i i believe that they are attracted to that and that's why it worked and and it does not work quite as good at this point but i think you know that registers even faster with them if they start chasing outboard prop wash and, and they bite something behind it i you know as dumb as it sounds i think they remember that and and pretty quickly it's like okay you know well i i follow the the prop wash and i see a hamburger and i eat it and it's always got hooks when the hamburger is right behind the prop wash and you know they back off of that stuff a little bit and then sometimes you gotta you know use planer boards and, and different methods maybe shallower running lures longer line you know it's just those are the things you need to fool them and then maybe if the trend turns to longer lines or whatever and nobody's been short line trolling for a little while then you you know you would go back to that that's how that's how things can change quite a bit part of the Part of the game, much more so when I started the first few decades of fishing now, is uh, different different stuff. Show them something they you know they haven't seen, whether it's the actual method itself, the lure types, those combinations, different angles, you know, hitting spots differently. Traditionally, we always fish from deep water to shallow to a certain extent at a 90 degree angle. In a lot of cases on the Canadian Shield, that's about your only option. But you know, sometimes you can drastically change angles and uh and in some spots you can actually get into the shallow stuff and cast out and and do different things and but just be just be showing them different different baits that they haven't seen hopefully and uh you know and 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 one part to that plan like going back to short line trolling if it hasn't been done for a while uh, you know, sometimes some of the classic baits that every, you know, there's always new lures coming out and the new stuff gets used. And, you know, if all of a sudden people, uh, you know, probably haven't thrown many suex or whatever the, the older bait may be in a, in a certain body of water for a while, then you can turn around and go back to something that used to work that everybody forgot about. Now it's different, right? So that's kind of the game play yeah no yeah. no no doubt yeah, yeah it's like it's you know it's like that in in all forms of fishing you know yeah. um at least you know like predator when you're targeting predators you know like bass i mean bass do the same thing i mean you're talking about um uh, you know typically you're, you're casting from deep to shallow you know you'll you'll try to do presentations from shallow to deep heck you know in the bass fishing world i mean it's kind of similar in in the fact that you know, guys will be, uh, you know, they'll, they'll know an area, a little specific area has been really, really good. And they know that if they change that angle, I mean, they just try different angles around that, you know, uh, different presentation, but come out at a different angle that can, that can work, you know, so it's kind of similar, uh, yeah. in that regard. But, but the thing that's interesting to me with, with, um, you know, your trip up there recently to Canada is like, why, like, what is it? Why are all those fish hitting near the boat, but not out farther? Like what is making them go, oh yeah, it's, I'm going to, I'm going to hit near the boat, you know, rather than hit, hit the, hit the bait at a distance. What's going on there? Yeah. Well, I wish I knew it's, uh, it's speculation now. A uh, mentor of mine, uh, Doug Johnson, he he did say that years ago when he started fishing Lake of the Woods, they would hit out more. I think that's just unfamiliarity with, with big lures in general. And in those days, the fish were just, you know, flat out dumber because they saw so so fewer lures than than they do these days there just weren't as many fishermen there weren't as many there were basically nobody knew the lake you know as good as doug johnson and a handful of other people now everybody with the charts and the electronics and stuff they're they're fishing good spots all the time so these fish are 
you know, seen seen baits constantly in in comparison, and there's more anglers, and 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 they're all pretty good. So it's a that's a that's a huge difference. So you could argue they're a little more wary, but I would also argue that Canadian fish are just that way traditionally in comparison to minnesota or wisconsin fish or anywhere else i fished even pennsylvania and new york i mean you catch them on figure eights in the states too but not at the same level i mean you you literally are are being absolutely correct by saying that at least half of the fish are boat side on the circle or figure eight by the side of the boat in Canada. So I, I think there's just something to that, that strain up there. I don't know if it's cooler water, whatever it might be, but they're just more prone to it. And, and you get trips like, like this one, if you're not, if you're not good at the side of the boat, you're just, you're not going to catch anything. I mean, <laughs> there's so few chances that are out there on the retrieve. So, you know, you better be watching and you, you know, you better be good at executing at the side of the boat. Those are the, those are the people that catch a lot more fish. I mean, there might be a magic bait found here and there, but, but being good at the side of the boat is, is one of the biggest deals if you're fishing the Canadian shield. And that, and that's no, uh, you know, uh, easy task either, you know, keeping your, uh, your, uh, you know what together when that happens especially right. if you've been out on the water for a long time then all of a sudden there's this giant musky that's like taking interest in your lure you know i mean it's it's shocking i've filmed i've filmed it quite a few times and it's like even to me you know i don't even have a rod in my hand it's like oh my goodness you know and so yeah it's that is not an easy thing to keep your composure and then remember just the the you know the technique of doing a proper figure eight or a big, you know, circle, you know, there's different ways to, to do it. But, um, but yeah, just to be able to, 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 to execute that figure eight properly when all hell's breaking loose, it's, it's, it, I mean, these are, these are the biggest fish. Um, yeah, they're, um, I mean, typically they're the, well, they're the biggest predators in the system, um, unless it's, I mean, I guess lake trout could typically be, I mean, lake trout could get, I, but most, uh, most often they're the biggest thing swimming right. you know, in the body of water. So seeing this thing coming at you like jaws with all the teeth and it's just thrashing and, you know, it's, it's some of the most uh, stressful freshwater fishing you can do, I think. Oh yeah, well there's there's no doubt about that, and that's one thing I tell people. It's kind of funny. This is one area where women seem to listen a little better than men. Men tend to be proud in my guiding years, and then once in a while I still run into somebody that hasn't done a whole lot of it, you know, when I'm doing shows and stuff like that. And I, I'll literally tell them, practice at the side of the boat, the figure eight. Don't just you know I. I show them or whatever, and you can see it's just, you know, not real, real consistent. And I'll, I'll be like, with every different lure you try, because some crankbaits, bucktail, whatever you might be using, they all perform a little differently when you're trying to do a circle or an eight or whatever it is you're doing. And, and I tell them, practice the straight circle, practice the eight pattern, practice changing your depths when you're going around all these different things with each lure if you're not familiar with this. And it's, it is kind of funny, men will typically, you know, they'll come and yeah, whatever. And then they, you know, they get burnt at the side of the boat time and time again. And uh, it really is, uh, and I, the, the other thing I tell people, I'm like, what are you gonna do when you see one coming? I mean, you, you might be wrong, but you should have a plan, whether it's a topwater or a bucktail or whatever, what are you gonna do to try and trigger that fish? Because ideally, if you see them pretty far from the boat, you wanna get that fish to hit before it gets to the boat. So, you know, are you gonna speed up? Are you gonna zigzag or, you know, might have a jerk bait? Are you gonna jerk and pause, let it hang? What are you gonna do? So you got that idea in your head. And, and a lot of people, and the reason I've always preached that is, uh, people freeze. I've, I've seen it so many times. Some actually just stop or do crazy stuff like that, but generally they don't do anything to trigger the fish. They just keep retrieving the lure the exact same way they've done it, rather than throwing in zigzags or speed ups or, or whatever it might be. 
because they haven't thought about it. I, you know, I, I always got an idea. I'm certainly not always right, but I'm going to, I'm going to try something. You know, I got one fish, uh, uh, at the, at the side of the boat by at a sinking lure and did a drop, you know, and, and that's something that's not the normal routine, you know, but, uh, I could just tell reading the fish, I'm like, he's not going to do it. He, uh, he went around once and I'm like, all right. So I, I dropped it on him and I saw him tip up and go straight down following it down there. And I'm like, okay. And, uh, you know, so there's, you got to try something. You can't just do the same thing. And it's, it's hard to do if you haven't thought about it and haven't practiced it. Yeah, I've I've seen it in the bass fishing world. You know, I've worked with Van Dam a ton, uh, and you know, I I've seen he I re, I just remember this very very well. This was several years ago. I mean, it's probably he said this probably twenty years ago to me. Um, I asked him about why at that time why he didn't fish swim baits. We're just you know typically swim bait you cast it out. You know, and there's all kinds of different swim baits, but like. You know, there's paddle tail swim baits and all different, um, uh, you, you know, the thing about freshwater fishing, it's so segmented, too, because you got musky fishermen, you got walleye fishermen, you got bass fishermen. They all have different names for different things, really, in, in their own, you know, walleye guys call lures different things and musky guys call. But, like, swim baits, typically you retrieve them and it's not an erratic retrieve. And, and, and Kevin was like, I just don't like... Uh, I don't like throwing swim baits because I can't trigger fish with them. Um, this was like 20 years ago. And so, uh, and there's probably people now that, yeah, you can so you can trigger fish with swim baits, but it's that erratic action, you know, that you can get out of like a jerk bait or, you know, even with Van Dam, you know, he could trigger with spinner baits and things like that. Like he, he made it and, and it really drilled. And I had seen it before I even met Kevin or anything. I mean, I knew how important it was to trigger fish, but like working with Kevin, it's super important. You can, you can trigger predators, you know, this goes with any predatory fish. Like there's things where a straight retrieve, yeah, you can catch some fish doing that, but little tweaks you can give a retrieve, a, you know, a presentation can really make all the difference in the world. And, and it's kind of like, this is probably a basic term for a lot of fishermen, but there's new fishermen coming up that may not may not understand. And this goes just runs the gamut from all all predatory species, I'd say, even in saltwater, where just tweaking your presentation, making that, and you've said it a ton, Pete. You know, even making that fish think that lure is getting away from them. You know, thinking that bait fish is getting away from them. So you speed up a retrieve. It goes maybe against what people would think. Like, oh, you're trying to get it away from them. No, you you even, I've seen it in bass. I've even walleyes, you know, walleyes, same thing. I, I think of myself, whenever I see, you know, walleye trolling going on, I'm thinking to myself, how many fish are these guys passing? that if they're able to do a more um, erratic retrieve, they'd be able to, to get that school, you know? But instead it's just, a, you know, Craig Bay just make the same retrieve, you know? And I don't care how, yeah, if you do a, if you do a circle or a, do a big turn, then that'll, you know, but that's only one, you know, you're not, it's not a repeated triggering that you're doing. It's just one move, I guess, I, I you know? When the, when you know musk or excuse me walleye guys will be a will do a turn and then when they straighten it out it kind of surges I guess is my understanding, right. but that's only yeah. one you know time it feels like you know like it's if you can I, I've always been amazed by that like if if you're getting if you're more new to fishing or you you haven't you know you haven't really uh, fully grasped the importance yet of like triggering fish. It's so important because it can make all the difference in the world. You'll have a fish that's like, and it, it could be musky, it could be a bass, it could be a walleye. You have a fish that's like neutral, but a retrieve can make all the difference in the world to get that fish to bite. And I, I know that you've ingrained it, you've, you know, into my head, Van Dam, all, and I feel very fortunate to have, you know, uh, to have heard you know this so many times in my career, but it is so important as an angler to understand that. Oh yeah, yeah, and then uh, you know to pay attention to those kind of things when they're happening. A lot, a lot of people are 
maybe pretty good at some of the retrieves and stuff like that, yet they're, you know, they're not really thinking to a certain extent. And it's hard to do. That's what makes it hard with muskies because there's just not a, a big sample size most days that makes it tough when they're not following at all or anything like that. Obviously harder to pattern structure as well, but it, you know, when you, when, when you got a fish to go, then, you know, you certainly want to think about not only the lure, what were you doing? Did that, you know, did that fish hit on a pause? Did it hit on a speed up? You know, whatever you were doing, you really want to pattern that and try and duplicate it. And the next day could be a totally different ball game. But on that given day, you know, usually, a you know, a pattern, if you figure it out, it'll be, uh, is, is going to exist for at least the rest of that day. And, uh, you know, you, you mentioned Mark Thorpe earlier was one of the most profound things I ever saw. We had, uh, you know, it's a tremendous fishery uh, out there and, 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 you know, it was even, even better, I guess, 20 years ago when there was a little less pressure. So you got a pretty good sample size and whatever, but it was really interesting that day. I figured out with a, uh, with a jerk bait that uh, buoyant and, uh, I had, I let a real long pause in, fish hit it on the rise. And I, it was amazing that day. I've never seen anything like it. We got that, we just absolutely nailed them after doing poorly uh, for fishing out there. It was, it was tough. And we, we turned it, I don't remember how many we caught, but we did well. And, and that was what they wanted that day. And, and uh, you know, we, we basically were all throwing buoyant and extending long pauses uh, without the retrieve. And every stinking hit the rest of that day came with a bait rising. No kidding. Yeah. Interesting. On a, on a floating jerk bait. Yeah. See, yeah. That, that's, what, that's what, what's wild to me now is that people forget that jerk baits used to float and there there used to be a time when there was no such thing as a suspending jerk bait <laughs> like i mean i mean i mean they've been around for a while don't get me wrong but there's like the rapple of floating minnow that was like the original like i guess jerk bait and there is something i've caught the hell out of uh, uh, fish on on floating you know minnows floating jerk baits you know that instead of just like pausing it's it's actually floating up in some respects you can get even more erratic crazy retrieves because that thing is is floating up it's you know and so but but it's it's weird how there is no one at least in the bass fishing world that throws a floating jerk bait anymore like zero yeah that's kind of interesting really and yeah. and sink is a sink is a pattern too you know yeah yeah but, yeah like a countdown man I, I exactly yeah. right yeah you know yeah. Uh, you know, and that's all the little stuff that if there's one thing that will make me kick my own hinder, it's when I catch myself after a day, something I didn't try, something I didn't think of, you know, it's, uh, you know, and I'm, I'm more apt to do it, I guess, to a certain extent with, uh, with walleyes or some of the other species that I maybe don't take quite as seriously, but you know, just the, the, the speed of the drop, you know, you're on a, on whatever kind of jig presentation. And sometimes you're, you know, you're not thinking you kind of do the same old thing and throw a eighth ounce jig or whatever it might be, depending on the depth and, and uh, you know, it, switching to a uh, three eighths ounce or something like that, well, that sucker's really dropping fast. Obviously, you got to work it faster, but you'll see, you'll see patterns with that. You know, you can be, you can be in only you know six eight feet of water, six six to ten, whatever it might be, and you end up using something that actually drops much faster than you would normally use. But you find out that's what they want. They want that aggressive drop, and your strikes are all coming at the bottom of that drop. And it. And and it yeah, yeah it's it seems like in the walleye world, uh, in the summertime in particular, the, that snap jigging, that kind of that erratic retreat, really because they, I guess you know, they're they're uh, the water temp, they're just kind of lethargic. But that that triggering retrieve can really get them just you know you're you're triggering something instinctual, I guess. Um, yeah. You know that's that that does the trick, and it's a perfect example. It's a perfect example when. When the fish, I've seen it with smallmouth, when the fish were just like, I saw a school of smallmouth years and years ago on the Susquehanna River that were just like, they were just, you could tell they're neutral, they're just cruising. 
but I was using a soft, um, you know, soft jerk bait. And the harder that I would, and more aggressive, I mean, incredibly aggressive. People, I think a lot of times when they're throwing, uh, you know, like soft jerk baits, they're not working them hard enough. They're not, they're not, they're not erratic enough with them, like just crazy erratic enough with them. Because I learned on that, that day with that school of smallmouth that the crazier that I worked that thing, it's just like they switched. They switched into like, I don't care about that thing that's worked like that. But as soon as I went, then they were like, they turned into different fish. And and that is super important as a fisherman that you realize that you can do that to fish with retrieves. And that goes along with just like, not just smallmouth, I would say, probably just nearly every predatory fish that's that's the case that that can happen oh well so that need that needs to be in your your toolkit for sure your yeah your toolkit and just uh think about it and i like i say that's uh that that's my biggest personal fault still that i catch myself doing once in a while i real you know it's obviously usually when it's slow to a certain extent musky fishing and i realize i'm I've turned into just a machine, you know, I'm trying some different things, uh, bait wise, but I haven't really done everything with the retrieves. And, you know, if I, I, I go a long period like that and then I, it kind of hits me and then, you know, well, I hell, get, dude, you're out, you're, you're out there for 14 hours. Yeah. You know, I mean, heaven forbid you might forget to throw in a particular kind of retrieve, you know, that, I mean, it's, it's, I don't know. It's, I will, I, I, I do believe that, that musky fishermen may be athletes. I mean, it is, it's long. I've been, I've been on a lot of musky shoots morning to, 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 well, I, for you, it's not always morning. That's true. That, the great thing about you is you're just like me. We're not morning people, but no. still long hours, still long hours. Oh, well, yeah. so you're talking about like, you know, lures and, you know, that's always fun. Just the fact that, you know, this, there might be a new lure that comes out, right? That can really like trip fish's trigger. You were at uh, ICAST, correct? Weren't you there? Um, yeah. What, did you see anything that kind of uh, got you going, your curiosity, like thinking that this could be a great musky bait? I, you're, you're sponsored by Livingston, right? Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Any, uh, anything you saw out there that was interesting? I didn't actually get around all that much, and there's not many musky manufacturers at ICAST actually. But uh, the show was show was pretty busy, and I didn't wander around all that much. So, uh, but I I really didn't see many musky manufacturers. I saw some guys that are in the industry that I talked to, but they you know in in. Uh, Pretty much every case, they said they didn't actually have a boot. They were just down there to see stuff and whatever. So, uh, no, I didn't see. I mean, other than what what Livingston has, uh, you know, and they had, they've got one new jerk bait and different colors and stuff like that. Uh, but no. I did not. I, I didn't see anything super new. That's the weird thing about it, though. To a certain extent, I don't. It the, the the new is is pretty tough to do anymore. Yeah. You know, I yeah. mean, you know, you know, basically yeah. anything revolutionary has kind of all been done. I mean, you see, you see some of the soft plastics. That's the one that has expanded probably the most in recent years. And but there's only so many different ways you can put tails on baits and 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 this that and the other. But it 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 can make a difference you know if it's if it's brand new uh right. in a lot of cases you see it and one of the things that you know i know you were still filming with me quite a bit in those days those red october tubes yeah. uh and the you know the bigger bladed bucktails those were some things that were, were actually pretty profound for a while that that hung on for a long time that really were unique and different and and outproduced for a period of time i you know i i can't say it's as strong as it used to be but uh it's it, that's pretty interesting stuff when you when you see that happen when there's definitely a pattern to it and even to the point where the majority of the people are fishing with them for a while that's what you end up getting you know and uh and now those trends really hung in there for a while and uh, and now 
Now, people are running uh, the one mistake I think some people make with the tubes is they're, you know, we we got to a point where everybody's running spinners off of them. And some guys get to the point where they're, they only run tubes with spinners. <laughs> and the problem with that is, is you kill a lot of the erratic action. You've got that extra flash. You've obviously got extra vibration. It's a trigger, but you get far less side to side because of that blade being there. So I, I always keep, you know, about half and half in the boat like that. And generally we'll have uh, spare hooks that actually have the spinners right on them so I can switch things up too if I want to. I can go bare hook and get more side to side or I can switch to a spinner if I think that might be a pattern or whatever. It's interesting. I've seen, um, you know, in the bass world, and obviously this could be translated into the musky world, I would think, quite easily. I mean, I'm seeing some some baits, you know, like crank baits with metal lips that are actually uh, uh, loose. So that me that that metal right. lip is is loose. Uh, that's interesting. I'm seeing now crank baits uh, with a blade, like on the belly. You know, it's almost like a little little arm comes off the belly and a little like a willow blade. You know, yeah. I've seen that. That's like a newer. I've even seen uh, like a jointed crankbait and half of the, the body, like the tail, I think it would be the tail is like metal, you know, so you have plastic and then you have metal. So the the the, the body that's, you know, half of the body is, is just vibrating like crazy and it's metal, you know? That's the fun of fishing. It's like, well, maybe that would work, you know? Maybe that's going to get you an extra fish or, you know, so then you buy it. And it's, I think about that too, like lures, just the fact, and I know you feel this way, you got a whole garage full of lures. Lures, um, the exploratory aspect of it's a huge part of fishing, as we talked about earlier, but then the lure aspect of it is like a huge part of fishing. And, and I would say that we're kind of living in the best time period ever with just the amount of lures, the quality of the lures, the hooks are better than they've ever been before, the attention to detail is better than it's ever been before. So um, it, it's, that's just a lot of fun. Like it's a huge part of fishing, just the, the lure aspect and, you know, and the what if. Well, this could, you know, this could be a real fish catcher, you know? Yeah, yeah. And that, that's yeah, kind of... I, I'm still always tinker, and I've always built all my own bucktails and modified. You know, the blade off the crankbait. I mean, heck, I, I I bet I did that 30 years ago with some. You know, and I thought it it was good, but it wasn't as good as I thought. The first time I I took a three hook crankbait, removed the middle hook, and put a blade there, Greg. I thought I was gonna catch every muskie on her. Uh, and catch them fast you're and, a true fisherman yeah yeah it, it it's funny all those little things though that's part of the excitement though too it's like finding the new spots and stuff we talked about earlier you know and then some of the stuff that i've tried that i thought would be so good just absolutely sucks so that's a little depressing <laughs> so, I, like, give I, me an I, example Oh, well, I mean, by the, 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 the blade deal, just, but, uh, you know, I've, I've taken, I, I've taken uh, a bunch of different top waters. Uh, oh, I'll, I'll, I'll give you one that may, that, that maybe recently I, I built uh, a combination spinnerbait inline bucktail and I would run either two blades on the inline part and a top blade and uh or just or just one on the inline and one top blade and i would tune everything up so that the top blades would touch the lower blades and you had to get it real you know because if if there's too much contact obviously it'll stop everything right but so here they are and and they're working and i get out and i'm thinking i've caught fish on them long story short but if anything not quite as much as as otherwise but mm. i i was so excited about that when i you know and i immediately after i tried the first one or two whatever the hell it was i went into the garage and i got a whole bunch of different blade combinations and colors and i tied them i don't know how much time i had in it and i put them in a tackle box man and i was gonna absolutely tear up the world 
and I didn't. <laughs> your 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 you your 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 heart was in the right place. Yeah, uh, you, you, you I, I I totally see where you're going there, and it was I think it was it was the right thinking, you know. And I don't I don't begrudge you at all for for going that route. Um, you know, you're you're a passionate fisherman. It was I I totally get it. Yeah, well, it, it, I I still say it was a good idea. I like but, it. Uh, I, I like yeah. the idea. You're, listen, you're a renowned lure maker, Pete. You know this is this is what l renowned lure makers do. You know you've designed all kinds of lures in the past. I'm not trying to blow smoke up your you know what, but it's you know you've got a, a, a you, there's a lot of history there with the lures that you've made, and I, that you could have been on. It could have been the next great you know lure. So you, you gotta you gotta you know this is you gotta tinker. Oh yeah, got a tinker and. Uh... I don't think you shot that one, but it's an interesting little deal on the Red October Tube. I just remembered that. Uh, that was a vertical jigging and current bait by the original designers. There was three guys, and uh, they gave me they gave me some baits, and I thought I thought that was cool and great. But I'm like, all, all they had, you know, they were all heavy weighted, and they were. Uh, uh, single hook sticking up so you can make bottom contact and not get stuck. And so I, right away, I'm like, just send me some tubes and I want to build the bodies. And so I, I, I made some that ran shallower and I put a stinger hook back by the tentacles and blah, 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 blah. And I got a, uh, beautiful figure eight strike over in Minnesota on a white tube in gin clear water. And the, the fact was that I would have never gotten the fish because of the fact that if it was a standard one, obviously it would have had more weight, so it would have been running different as well. But, but I commented while I'm fighting the fish because it just came up behind the bait on the figure eight like a bucktail and it nipped the tentacles in the back and got stuck on the stinger hook. Well, these guys were at a at a musky show in Chicago that produced the Red October tubes, and all they had was their standard uh, tubes at the time. And the show aired the Saturday that started on a Friday. It aired on Saturday morning, and they came up to me later. One guy was a big guy. He's like six six. Hans was his name. And <laughs> Hans comes up to me and he says, I don't know whether to punch you or give you a big hug. I said, well, I'm not much of a hugger, but I said, the size of you, I said, I'll, uh, I'll definitely take the hug. He, he said, uh, the white tubes were gone and I don't know how long. And then the, uh, he had to run down to the shop somewhere. He had to get wire and he had, uh, and he, in the booth, he was bending up stinger hooks because everybody wanted a tube like Pete's got, you know, with the yeah. stinger hook. Got the fit, yeah. Yeah, and you you would run that. You would uh, basically, I, I, if I'm, my memory serves me, you would run that <clears throat> that stinger is coming out of the the tentacles, basically out of the the back of the tube. So I imagine you were taking that wire, wrapping around the main hook, right? Is that what you're doing, or where? Well, I ran, a, I ran a straight wire all the way through with a few droppers and oh, okay. And, and but I had that treble hook treble, in the back. Yep was right you know and, and that was currently not the you know not the thing they started producing them right away after that but uh and that you know, kept, they, yeah their application was was what it was where they fished and developed those lures and believe me they worked well for their application you know they kind of you know they they did well on them right right away and 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 got quite a bit of recognition but they they hadn't really even thought i i don't believe of the you know the casting all through the water column and that's one thing that's pretty neat about the tubes you can build the the casting erratic tubes with different weights and you know you can have a you can have a bait to kind of cover the you know six to ten foot range and you can you can basically have just a tiny little bit of weight in front and you can run them you know a, a, a foot or two over the weeds as well you know all depending and uh so that you know they, they they've expanded a lot with with all of that but the, but that's what's kind of neat about them you can you can do so many different things you can have weights inside that 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 slide instead of you know are, are permanently fastened right right, right. 
Yeah, I hadn't I, thought about that. Yeah. yeah. What are so it's you know obviously, I I, I saw a video, I think it was on Instagram, um, of this guy. I don't know where it was, but they're freaking out. This guy hooked a, a really big muskie, and. I noticed that they had a long pole going in the water and it was for their for their forward facing sonar. You know, and I was just like, there it is. Forward facing sonar in, in the musky world. It's like and, and and of course I knew it was going on. I mean, we had talked about it. But and I can't help it as a fisherman. It's like that is amazing technology, man. To be able to to go up and just on the bass fishing side of things, to go, let's say you're fishing a you know a, <clears throat> an area with bridge pilings, and you're like, well, I wonder if there's any fish there. Forward facing sonar. Oh, yeah, they're right there. Oh yeah, there's a huge school right there. Oh, and they're behaving this way. That you know, <clears throat> it's one thing if you have you know a denser population of fish, like you know. Uh, obviously panfish highly dense uh bass a little less dense but still dense same with 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 walleyes and you got muskies totally different situation um i i i know that uh, obviously you know i'm not a young uh pup anymore um so it's it's one of those situations where i'm like is it just because i'm getting to be an old fuddy duddy that i feel this way but for whatever, I mean, forward-facing sonar for me is, for musky fishing, for those real apex predators where there's not a lot of them, I just like, I just pause a little bit, you know, with it. And, and but, but then I'm like, well, then, you know, we got to have more regulations. You got to protect the fishery more. And then I'm like, well, I don't want to be that guy either, you know? <laughs> So I'm like, uh, where where do you fall in this? Um, it's it's a strange one. I it's an inc it's incredible technology. I realize. I mean, you can it, it, certain times you can almost like see the fish is like a, a, an image of the fish itself and it actually swimming. It's it's remarkable. Yeah. And Garmin's got their stuff's gotten even better. You know, with it, you know now everybody's trying to you know it seems like Garmin is kind of you know, maybe the one that's doing the most with the forward facing. So everybody's trying to, it's like an arms race now with forward yeah. facing sonar. So it's, it's a little, it's a little concerning, I guess, to me. Yeah, that's a, that's a real tough one. I, me personally, I've, I've gone with uh, a couple of guys that are good at it. So I've seen what they call in the musky world, they call it sharp shooting. I don't know, but yeah, you're driving around in the open water, uh, looking for fish and then you cast to them, uh, long story short. And, and frankly, it's not for me. I've kind of made up my mind. I'm, I'm not going to do that. I, I just don't enjoy it. I don't think I necessarily have to prove myself that much I and I well it, it's not fun to me it just doesn't seem like fishing to a certain extent uh it, it for, for me I've decided it's it's not the deal but I can it, it's a tough one there's some things I just flat come out against I don't like it because uh people are killing fish with it. There's no doubt, you know, they're hunting open water fish in hot water and some of them are fishing too deep. Now, some of them do it the right way and they'll only target fish in the top 15. That's literally the only place they look and that's the only fish they will cast at. But there's also people that are seeing them way down in the water column when there's drastic temperature changes and oxygen changes and, and, and muskies are not good at bleeding their bladders. So you get barotrauma issues and all these different things, especially when you get down below 20 feet. And if you go down to 30, you can, you can find muskies even deeper than that in the summer. Uh, you're going to kill a bunch of fish. And unfortunately, with the social media aspect of it and the likes I talked about, you know, there's, there's a lot of people that, uh, you know, are putting the photos in, in front of the fishery that definitely not long-term thinking. So I have, a, I have a great disrespect for that. 
uh, to a certain extent, I, I can't really blame the companies. I guess you're, you know, you're nuts if you're in business and you're, and you're trying to keep up and produce technology that people want and is, is amazing and all those different things. And then I look at the young guys who are out there that are trying to guide whatever, make a name in the industry or combinations thereof. And they know, and it's, it's a simple reality, if you go out in open water and troll or just cast, you know, blindly, like I basically did for years, how I figured out the open water fishing was finding the right spots, but you're still, you're not casting that a fish the majority of the time, right? You're just covering water. Uh, you literally, if you're, if you're trying to make a name for yourself, prove yourself, get as many pictures as you can, get as many fish as you can, you will literally not even remotely compete without it. That's a, that's a simple fact. So I look at, you know, I look at young guys that are really into fishing and are in a competition to a certain extent for business and whatever, whatever you want to call it, knowing, knowing realistically, they, they, they can't compete effectively, especially with an open water bite without that technology. You know, I don't know. I, I, I can't, I can't frown on somebody that's, that's doing it. The only people I can frown on are the, are the ones that will still go after fish knowing that there's a, a better percentage of the fish dies when they catch it than otherwise. I have zero respect for that. Well, I'll tell you, it's, it's, you know, the more I think about it, you're, you're, if you go right into like, especially if you're a younger angler, and you go right into like musky fishing and you have forward facing sonar you would think that you're you're really kind of it, it, it's a shortcut because you're you're bypassing a lot of stuff that you should be learning as far as like why the muskies would be in that location where you just because you're scanning around oh you just found them you know whereas like yourself and other guys that have been doing this for years and years and years it's like you you got to you have a deep relationship with the, that fish <clears throat> and why you understand more than anybody why they're doing what they're doing, why they're eating what they're eating, why they're uh, locationally, why they're there. And it's just like, okay, now I'm just going to scan, take this forward-facing sonar and just scan all over the place. Scan, 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 scan. Oh, there's one right there, you know? And you're not even doing any of the homework that you had to do in the past to get you to that point. All you're doing is just, I mean... Maybe I'm simplifying it, but it, it does, it, that does bother me. And then the other thing that bothers me too, for, for, for I think a lot of anglers, I feel this way. <clears throat> fishing, the fun of fishing is the unknown, right? It's the unknown. It's like making a presentation. Could that be the presentation? You know, right. forward facing sonar, you already know the fish is there and you know how big that fish is. You know, a lot of times, especially if it's a, you know, big fish like a muskie, you can have an idea anyway. Like you can, you know, well, that's. Oh, yeah. And so it's taking away some of the, the most beautiful parts of fishing, the, the unknown and the and and it's that ex exploratory aspect, too. You know, uh, yeah, you get that when you're exploring, but you're scanning. But it's it's the anticipation of this could be the cast, you know. It's the what if, and it, it, that's what I don't like about it. Uh, that's you know one of the big reasons I don't I don't like it. It's it's the there's things I do like about it. Don't get me wrong, but that's one thing that does bother me about it is that you already know before you make a presentation whether a, a fish is there or not. And to me, that's always been a huge part of fishing. I've always really enjoyed that part of not knowing. You know, it's that, it's that anticipation. Oh yeah, and uh, you know, and then and frankly, full disclosure, I have Mega Live, and and I'm I'm going to I'm going to use it mainly that not not for muskies. I've kind of made you you basically in a nutshell. You describe my thoughts right there. I you know, the unknown is important to me. Uh, you know, not not knowing the fish is there and seeing it coming is uh, you know I don't know I I. I 
I, I, I can't leave that. I, I, I just can't get myself to the point where even though it's advantageous, there's a little, there's a little ego thing in there, you know, where you're, you're like, oh man, I, I would like to catch more. I would like to take advantage of it and all that, but it, it, it really would take the fun out of it for me. But it's a, you know, it's an interesting tool to a certain extent to, uh, to watch how fish react and stuff like that. There's, there's a lot about it that's cool. I mean, you know, one thing I got to say for years, I ice fished without any kind of sonar or anything and was happy as a clam. And uh, so I guess everybody's got different levels, but now, I mean, I'd go nuts night fishing without any electronics. I yeah. mean, that's yeah. part of the fun for me. So that I guess everybody's got little different, yeah. different levels there with, uh, you know, how far they want to take it and what the enjoyment is. But that's part of the fun of ice fishing to me is uh, actually watching the sonar. So I don't know, you know, it's yeah. Uh, yeah. That's a, that's a good point too. No, no doubt for sure. Um, well, I want to thank you for taking the time to talk with me, Pete, as always. You're always very generous with your time, especially having to clean up uh, a bunch of storm debris. So, you know, you've had a busy day and, and, and to fit this podcast in. I, I really, really appreciate it, dude. And I always enjoy talking with you. Um, if I could ask you just a few, a, a, two more things, um, yeah. because uh, people want to know. Uh, number one. Give me your best summer musky tip. I'm putting you on the spot. Can you think of one one tip that you could give someone musky fishing in the summer that could help them be a more successful musky angler? Uh, maybe I did. To a certain extent, I already gave it when I was, uh, you know, talking about triggering that's more important than ever in summer to uh have an idea to think in your head regardless of the lure what you're gonna do to uh to trigger a fish but the the, the other one would be uh just the uh the speed aspect and i catch myself not doing that uh, to a certain extent and usually when the the warmer the water is uh the more they are willing to really burst and, and chase speed, generally not in the cooler water as much so. And uh, sometimes really, really burning and not just a bucktail. Uh, that's a that's a good thing to try. But uh, your your soft plastics and stuff, too, especially paddle tail type stuff. But uh, not so much so with the top water, I would say. In summer, you know, there's very few baits that get the right sound. It's kind of all a sound thing with top water, and I just, uh, I just don't think for the most part with muskies that's a that's a good idea. But uh, swim baits, uh, you know, paddle tail, which technically is a is a swim bait, and you know, crank baits, and, and certainly bucktails, just high speed. And if you're older like me, get a get a smaller bucktail. It's hard to do with a lot of these bigger bucktails. If you're a young 20 year old and you're strong as heck, you can do it. But, uh, you know, they'll, they'll hit smaller blades too, small single blades. I, I think it's just that speed factor that once in a while will trigger fish that's sitting there that would have otherwise followed. It's, it's almost a pooper get off the pot kind of thing reaction. You want to be moving it that fast so that if they're hiding under structure there, they literally have to make up their mind to grab it right away. And that's, you know, that's, that's one way that you got a shot at uh, triggering some fish, you know, that, that would normally just follow or something like that. You can actually get them to strike on the retrieve that way. Well, you know how much I always love asking you uh, your thoughts on current events. Is there anything that you need to get off your chest? Anything that's going on right now that won't get this video taken down? I need to say that off of YouTube. But is there anything that is like, yeah, you know what? I want to I, I want to talk to Greg about this, um, you know, because listen, this is a fishing podcast, but when you're fishing, you talk about everything, especially musky fishing. You got a lot of time to kill, right? So uh, yeah. this is very much fishing. Current events is fishing. You know, of course you should talk about these things. That's that's my viewpoint. So is there anything you want to get off your chest, Pete? Right now is your opportunity. Well, you know, it would actually be uh, the fact that it seems like most people are afraid to use their First Amendment rights 
And actually, the fishing industry is a pretty good example. I guess most of the people that I talk to are in the fishing industry. And it's, uh, let's just say that on social media or I don't know, general conversations where there's more than one people listening. People are so afraid of, uh, and I don't know if you call it being woke or what what you would even call it to a certain extent, but uh, I don't know. I think it's important to, uh, you know, get your actual thoughts out there. And so many people, Greg, these days seem to be completely afraid of, Doing that, I guess, in general, let's just say the conversations that happen in the boat or one-on-one, they're, you know, pretty wide ranging and you hear it and you hear people get super passionate. And I mean, this is, you know, this is not stuff that they've got any doubts in their mind about. They'll talk about it, but boy, they will not talk about it anywhere else, but one-on-one. I don't know. I, I think that's, I think, dang- that's so I, weird. I think and, it's dangerous too. I think yeah, it's dangerous. Very- I think I think it's dangerous too. I I think one of the reasons, you know, in these these last three years, Pete, um, that I would occasionally go on Facebook and just post something. I didn't, you know, I didn't. I just that people would. I I I'd do it so that people knew where I stood on things. Because I didn't want to be one of those people that were like, well, I'm not going to say I might feel that way and I might feel like there's something really bad going on, you know, but I'm not going to say anything. I do not want to be that person. I do not want to be that person. If I feel something's really, that's the reason I I, I drove to Washington, D.C., 2,300 miles round trip for that Defeat the Mandates march, you know, because that was so outrageous to me what was going on. Uh, globally, really, you know, but, and then I posted it. I post, I made a little video and I posted it on social media because I wanted people to know where I stood and that I wasn't going to be, you know, uh, you know, not uh, scared to say how I thought, because you, if, if everybody is scared to think, uh, say how they think, right. You can have, they, they can be just bulldozed over and this, this uh, it, it, p- humans can do crazy things. Historically, they, all you got to do is just look at what has happened in the past. And if you feel like things are wrong, you got to speak out and you can't, you know, you, you can't let, um, you, you can't let, uh, maybe this is too strong a word. I don't think it is. You can't let atrocities just go unchecked. You know, so it's important to speak out. That's what I've always admired uh, about you, Pete, is that you have that courage to speak out. And and boy, in this time period that we're living in right now, there's nothing more important as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, well, it, you know, it, people could argue it's cliche, but, uh, you know, freedom is everything to me. And, and there's so many ways we could talk for hours about how we're losing it and it's being attacked and it's a shame censorship happens there's no doubt about it i see the shadow banning and that goes on with me all the time unfortunately and you know your your sponsors don't like it in some cases and this that and the other but you know at, at the end of the day i think it's the worst thing possible uh people should not be that concerned about hopefully they value their freedom more than shadow banning and this that and the other and i think that uh you know if more people just you know whatever that's such a great example whatever you talk about in the boat that you're passionate about to get really what riled up and your voice raises and this that and the other if you are unwilling to say that anywhere else i don't know i think i think that's a problem I think it's a real big problem. I agree. I agree, my friend. Well, we will end at uh, on that note. And again, dude, I really appreciate you you coming on, and especially with all the stuff that you had to deal with with the you know chopping down you know trees and getting your your property back in order. But yeah, it's always a pleasure, my friend. And um, I you know I know that you're you're doing your uh, your YouTube stuff just like you know seems like everybody is but I'm telling you I really feel this way I know I I um 
I harp on it probably too much, but it is an ex- as much as YouTube drives me nuts with the censorship crap that's happening. Uh, so Rumble, people should really check out Rumble because there's no censorship going on there. And I think that that's probably where I'm going to start uploading content as well. Um, but it's, you know, I don't know. It's, um, I do still, it's, I'm conflicted because there's so many amazing things happening as far as like the democratization of video production, right? So like I'm in, I'm old school video production. I mean, it's taken me, I've, I've had to come to this whole social media and YouTube, like kicking and screaming. I've been very stubborn. I've just wanted to do things my way, you know, and that hasn't worked. You have to play the social media kind of games. But with that being said, there's a few tricks I've learned here lately, Pete, and we should probably talk. Um, and I'm f- happy to share it, but, you know, you need to get going. But um, but we can talk another time. But um, but it's there's there's some really interesting things I've kind of learned with Instagram and also with YouTube that can that is is generating more views and like just subscribers and stuff. It's exciting to me because I love the idea of growing your own audience, you know, and not having to worry, um, you know, about the the gatekeepers of the past and being concerned with, you know, and I, I just like the idea of growing your own audience and then providing content uh, for them. And, and that to me is very, very exciting. But um, I don't know why I went on this tangent, dude. But my my point being is, I, I if if you want to if you want to talk about that stuff, I'd like to collab with you on stuff, dude. Do more podcasts if you want to start a podcast. I'd love to help you. I to me, I want your voice out there that more. Like I'd love for you to have a podcast, you know. And in my fantasy world, you would start a podcast, Pete. I'd get this thing to where it needs to be, and then we could like grow each other, and then our YouTube. YouTube channels would be huge, and then we would just be kings of the fishing industry. Um, <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. So you know, if you're if you're interested in any of that, let's let's plan on uh, anyway. I, I'm just whatever. But my my point being is, I think this is so exciting. The time that we're living in. Yeah, there's a lot of nonsense going on, but there's a lot of positives too. This podcasting with you is is a prime example. Just the fact that I can be in my basement right now and talk to one of the greatest anglers of all time. Um, I think that's the way we'll we'll conclude this podcast, my friend. So uh, thank you, my friend, and uh, let's try to let's try to actually meet in person for real. Yeah, we should fish. That, you know, we can definitely solve a lot of problems and go over all the things you just talked about. So. I'm with you on that, but but my dogs did wake up. They we must have bored them because they were sleeping the whole time. But I think I think they're actually ready to do something here, so I should probably go. That sounds like a good plan. And and honestly, I don't think they should be bored at all. I think this is actually one of the best podcasts that we've done together, Pete. So um, this is I'm I'm looking forward to getting this thing up to the interweb. And uh, again, it's been a pleasure. I'll let you go. Thank you, my friend. Have a good one, man.